Hi, my name is Leilani, and today on this channel, we are gonna be talking about understanding sensory processing. And in the second half of the video, we are gonna be talking about ways that you can adapt your curriculum that you have at home for your kids to help them succeed and provide and meet all their needs. I'm gonna give you some tips, some tools, some support. There's also a handout that you will be able to print. It is in the description box below. It's gonna take you to my website. It's got over 50 ideas that you can use to help with accommodating and manipulating your curriculum, just to help them become successful. And while you're on my website, you might as well just click over to the uh, contact me form, fill it out so you can join the newsletter and keep up to date with what's going on with me and my channel. So. Back to understanding sensory processing disorder, since that is what we are gonna be talking about today. So as a little bit of a disclaimer, sensory processing disorder does not define who a student is. It's not a crutch. Sensory processing disorder is here for us to understand what's going on inside of our kids, inside of their nervous system, their brain, how everything works, so we can find better accommodations and tools and tips to help them function better in life. Because some of these things, some of these triggers, some of these behaviors that is a result of sensory processing disorder can be really, really debilitating and, and it's hard for them to function in everyday life during certain situations. And it's also very important to understand the complexity of sensory processing disorder. So if you notice that your child has a struggle in a specific area, you can go out there, and I encourage you to go out there to do more research and understand different tools and techniques you can do to help strengthen them. We are their advocates. Yes, there are amazing therapies out there, occupational therapy, which is the big one, but you are their parent and you are working with them on a daily basis. They are not. So it's important for us to understand these things and where our kids are coming from. So with all of that being said, just remember they are created who they are supposed to be. Their identity is not in a label or name. Their identity is in God. So with that all being said, let's move on to what sensory processing disorder is. So sensory processing actually describes how the nervous system receives sensory messages and turns them into responses. So it's receiving, organizing, and then responding. And the nervous system itself is the road that things are going through, communicating, from the rest of your body to your brain. So when there's a disruption in any of this, that's sensory processing disorder, which is a huge umbrella with all these little things underneath it. We're gonna talk about all these different things. So first of all, you know you have five senses. You could probably name them with me. You have touch, sight, smell, hearing, and taste. You know these. With sensory processing, it may affect one or two or all of these things. So that's why it can get kind of crazy. Uh, however, what I did forget to mention is that there are three hidden senses that are talked about within sensory processing disorder. The first one is called proprioceptive sense. This is the body's ability to sense movement, action and location. So it's gonna allow a person to walk without thinking. It allows them to, to touch their elbow with their eyes closed because they know where their elbow is, right? I, I don't actually see it, right? I, I just know where it is. So the second is called vestibular sense. Now this creates a sense of balance and spatial orientation. It allows you to move smoothly when you're walking, balance when you're doing activities like walking, running, standing up. If you see a lot of kids that have a hard time with balance or some kids that'll shuffle when they move or they look like they're jerky when they move, they are struggling with their vestibular system and that is under the umbrella of sensory processing disorder. And the third one is interoception. Now that is gonna be the awareness of your internal organs. So if you have a stomach ache, that's interoception. If you have a headache, if you need to go to the bathroom, whether or not you sense that, that falls under this category. Now my daughter, this is an area that she struggles with tremendously. There's been situations where she has been running around playing and all of a sudden she throws up and then she's back to playing. She probably didn't even feel that she had a stomach ache. We have taken her to the doctor where she gets blood drawn and all she does is stare at the needle and then the nurse and think nothing of it. 
And there's the, um, the potty training, which is a whole, whole, whole nother situation. But we are working with her occupational therapist on that, so, and, and I'm working on it, so, yeah. So now you know the eight senses that are talked about very frequently when it comes to sensory processing disorder. And what's fun, like I said before, is they mix and match. And sometimes they respond differently. They could be severe, they could be very mild, they could be over-responsive, or they could be under-responsive. And so that's where we get into the four main patterns of sensory processing disorder. The first one is sensory modulation disorder. And this has three subtypes within it. The sensory modulation disorder is going to be the regulation of the sensory information. So the first one is going to be the sensory over responsivity. It's going to be your hypersensitive kids. So for example, and see if you can relate, your kid hears loud noises and they cover their ears because it's just way too loud. Your kid sees bright colors and it gives them a headache. Tags, they have tags in the back of their clothes. It drives them crazy. And it, be, it can be located in different parts of their body. So maybe like the tags in the neck, drives them crazy, but the tags in the pants, that doesn't even phase them. It can get really interesting, some of these combinations. And that's why when it comes to sensory processing disorder, everybody displays it differently. Then you have your sensory under responsivity. That's going to be your hyposensitivity type kids. And those are the ones, they don't cry when they get hurt. Or if you say their name over and over and over again and they don't respond to you until you walk up and touch them on the shoulder. And thirdly, you have your sensory cravers. And those are the kids that run around, bang their head on the wall, put spicy stuff all over their food because they can't just get enough of the sensations that they need to just calm their nervous system down. It's like their nervous system can't focus until that need is met. And that's exactly your sensory seekers. They also like to make really weird sounds. That's one of the, the things that could possibly show up with a sensory seeker. They'll be, I have a sensory seeker and the noises that comes out of his mouth. I'll just leave it there. I'll just leave that there. So all of that that I just mentioned is your sensory modulation disorder. So the second one is going to be your sensory discrimination disorder. And this, these are the kids that push too hard on things or they push too lightly on things. So they're having a hard time regulating the force and the pull. It'll also show up if they're trying to pick up items, they can't get a grasp on things properly or they're clumsy, they may drop stuff, just they're walking around, they just drop things randomly because they're not holding it tight enough. It'll also display itself in speed, fast or slow. They're not going fast enough, they're not going slow enough. And so once again, this can touch on all the different senses. So the last two subtypes that fall under the umbrella of the sensory-based motor disorder, they're called they're called postural ocular disorder and dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is one we don't really talk about too much, but it is very, very common. The postural ocular disorder, that's gonna be the one that manages balance, tracking items with your eyes and controlling movement and strength. Now dyspraxia is the planning, the scheduling and executing in a sequence, moving from one task to another. And it also displays itself a lot in fine motor skills. So when a child has dyspraxia, you want to work with them a lot, refining those fine motor skills. My uh, child that has dyspraxia doesn't know how to tie a shoe. And that's something that was always a struggle for that specific child. So both of those fall under the umbrella of sensory based motor disorder because both happen when the response based on sensory input is not appropriate. So they get the input and their response is not appropriate. Like I said, tying a shoelace, they couldn't, they couldn't do it. That was something that was very difficult for them. So I made you a little chart. So you can check out this chart. It covers everything that we talked about. You can go through, you can see how things combine differently. And also remember that all of this is falling under a very large umbrella called sensory processing disorder. Like I said before, it's really good to know where your child may fall within that umbrella so you can now target, go down that rabbit hole, 
and Target. And once again, I'll come back and say, remember, it is not a label. You are always teaching to your kids. You are not teaching to a disorder. So keep that in mind as you go through this. Meanwhile, here are some tips, some practical tips that you can use with your curriculum to help you. As a preface, whenever it comes to curriculum, it is so important that you remember that you are teaching to your child and not to the curriculum. It's very easy for us to get wrapped up in wanting to just teach what's on the page and just get it done and over with. And if, it, if they're not adjusting to the curriculum, you, you want to throw the curriculum away or you want to say that the curriculum is awful and when in fact sometimes we just need to make modifications or add things to the curriculum and be creative. Don't get married to, to your curriculum. There's no perfect curriculum because there's no perfect child and not all children are the same, especially when it comes to sensory processing disorder. None of us are the same. Here are some tips, some practical tips that you can use with your curriculum to help you. As a preface, Whenever it comes to curriculum, it is so important that you remember that you are teaching to your child and not to the curriculum. It's very easy for us to get wrapped up in wanting to just teach what's on the page and just get it done and over with. And if, it, if they're not adjusting to the curriculum, you, you want to throw the curriculum away or you want to say that the curriculum is awful. and. When in fact, sometimes we just need to make modifications or add things to the curriculum and be creative. I mean, even in the public school system, that's what we did. When it wasn't working for the students, we did something to, to the curriculum to change it to help them. We're teaching to the kids, not the curriculums. Don't get married to, to your curriculum. There's no perfect curriculum because there's no perfect child and not all children are the same, especially when it comes to sensory processing disorder. None of us are the same. So let's quickly talk about those writing utensils. So with writing utensils, we obviously, all of us want our kids to write. So when you have a child with sensory processing disorder, they may display their writing as too hard right or too soft so there's a couple things you can do you can weight the pencil so if you have the pencil weighted with either a little weight that you can buy from Amazon or something like that it, stick it on the pencil they're aware of the weight of the pencil and so it helps them to stabilize the pencil and write more properly you can also stick sandpaper underneath the papers so they can feel the tracing writing with markers on whiteboards really really helps out a lot of those kids that are struggling with writing with the pencil you can also change out the lead you can try writing up and down on an easel so those are some stuff that you can do to help them with sensory processing some accommodations that you can make now if you're looking at the printout that i have for you I have placed them, and it's actually gonna be right here, right there, let's just scoot over. So we have under responsive and over responsive. So let's kind of look at the over responsiveness. So when they have their work, you may wanna find curriculum that is in black and white. You wanna limit the amount of color because the color can be overwhelming, distracting. So we wanna limit the color and the worksheets. If you do have a colorful curriculum that you really enjoy and you notice that it's really bothering them, you can maybe photocopy it in black and white so they don't see the color. Noise tends to bother a lot of our kids. So another thing you can do is separate them from the noise. You can also give them noise canceling headphones and sometimes soft music played in the headphones can really, really help them maintain their focus. Have a separate room for them or a corner that they can go to and just be by themselves so they can regroup and gather and also be able to focus on the tasks that they're doing at hand. Find curriculum that helps them to work independently. Another thing that you can do with your kids, if you notice that they're kind of not with it, you can utilize those deep pressure hugs. Deep pressure hugs can really just change a kid completely when they're struggling. So if you haven't tried those, try them. Deep pressure hugs aren't also great when you get a hug from mom or dad. They're also helping them stimulate the nervous system. You can also give them a weighted blanket or a lap weight to help them center and focus. Using a quiet voice. So those kiddos that when loud noise bothers them, if you can make it a point when you're instructing to them that you use a nice, quiet, soft voice with a lot of intensity, they may focus better with that. 
Mazes, hidden pictures, dot to dot activities can be something to help using a dimmer light and setting them further away from the sun or the window and allowing for brain breaks, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about those later. Under responsive, now these are the kids that they do need those bright colors in the classroom. They do need colorful worksheets. Those are the ones that you really wanna incorporate a lot of singing and movement within the curriculum making up songs frequently, vibrating pillow, using stickers to teach and Velcro. When you, you can have those charts with the Velcro on it and they can take things off, put them back on. That kind of helps with the sensory, also helps them focus more. Provide fidget toys, basket of fidget toys. Finger painting, sensory bin, art. This is a lot of Montessori type things, hands-on kinesthetic, really, really helps. Using a light table and of course, uh, brain break. I also mentioned another cool little thing that I, I found fun is if you get like rubber bands, not like rubber bands, but like those elastic bands that uh, if you go work out, you may work out with them, wrap it around the bottom of the two chair legs and tie it. Then they can kind of play with it with their feet while they're doing their work. That's a fun little technique. My favorite was always the vibrating pillow because Sometimes they will just sit there and, and I don't know what, for me, you put a vibrating pillow on my lap or whatever, it, I, I can't, nope, not going to be able to focus. But for some of those kiddos, it just really helps them go, okay, I'm getting that sensory need, so now I can focus on this task at hand because that need is met. Except my son did have his vibrating pillow and threw it at his brother and busted his head open. I'm not joking. <laughs> That's one way to you know, stimulate the nervous system. I wouldn't recommend throwing vibrating pillows. So some general tips with the body positioning. We don't always have to sit straight up and down at the chair with proper posture. It's good for you. It's also good to have your feet, you know, firmly planted on the floor. If they can't reach the floor, stick a step stool underneath. So there is that grounding and that that is a good technique that you can try out. But sometimes we wanna get our kids out of that position. And one of my favorite positions is laying them on their stomach to do their work with a clipboard in front of them. I've also taped their work on the wall so they're working vertically. That's another little technique you can use. We utilize our swing downstairs, sitting them with a the clipboard in the swing to do their work while they're constantly moving and giving themselves that stimulation they need, meeting those needs for their nervous system so they can focus on the work at hand. An exercise ball. An exercise ball has been kind of like the go-to gift. There's so many ways that you can use it. So first of all, you could do tons of warm-up activities and exercises with the exercise ball just to kind of get the blood flowing and everything waking up and focused. But you can also sit on the exercise ball. Now, I found having a kid sit on the exercise ball and do their schoolwork can potentially be dangerous. It, it yeah, not as bad as a vibrating pillow, but it can also be dangerous. My, you know, kids will bounce on the ball and the ball will slip and then they'll force, you know, that kind of thing. So they have somewhere, some genius out there has created this chair that's stable with an exercise ball in the middle of it. So if you can afford one of those chairs with the exercise ball, it keeps the ball in place and it keeps them moving. You got it. You got it. It's awesome. This exercise ball chair thing. It's awesome. So that is, that has been a great tool. Also, another thing that's fun to do with the little bitty, no, you can do with the older kids too, is doing their assignments on the sidewalk chalk outside. They're laying down on their belly, writing with sidewalk chalk. Okay, so that not only gets them laying on their stomachs, but they're writing on that sidewalk and that surface is bumpy, so that's helping them with the input there. Oh, it's awesome. It's, too, it's one of those that's like you kill two birds with one stone kind of exercises. Schedules, routines, and environments. So having a daily routine or schedule, for some kids, they need this. One that changes very, very little they need this. Also giving them warnings saying, you know, look, today's not going to look the same as it did 
last week on this day. So we actually have to go to the doctor today, so expect that happening. Giving them that warning kind of helps them with some of their anxiety. Also, when you're giving them assignment, giving them a good starting point at any point saying, we are starting this assignment and we are gonna finish in 30 minutes, regardless of where we are in the assignment. And that kind of leads me into the, the wonderfulness of having a timer. That's right, the wonderfulness of having a timer. So what we do is we will sit my kid down to do math and we, t we tell them, look, you have 15 minutes to do this assignment. Here's the timer and you can see it. Now, focus for 15 minutes and then you get a break. Regardless of where you are in the assignment, you have 15 minutes. So that forces them to really focus. It also helps with discipline, self-discipline, because they're having, in motivation, they're having to focus themselves and be motivated to focus because they want that break on the task at hand so they can get as much accomplished. A lot of these kids, especially the older kids, want to be able to function. Now, we do use the timer with my youngest daughter as well. That's mostly for her to see how long something is gonna take I haven't seen, I know they say that it works, but I haven't seen results quite yet with her, but, but we still use it. And we also use it to help her understand when we're gonna switch to another task. She has a hard time with transitioning between tasks, and so, yeah. Use a lot of visuals with schedules and pictures, some, like I said, some with those Velcros that you can pull off and put in the container when it's done. Those are great, also pictures around the house with things in order. If you have a younger kid, you wanna do those picture order things. With older kids, you can just write it out. So they have an idea of what comes after what. For older kids, you wanna teach them how to keep a planner. A really good idea is to have a section in the planner that says these are the three things that you are going to accomplish for today. And then you can build that to four things in a couple weeks, five things in a couple weeks, but they need to learn how to maintain their planner and you have to be on top of that. And that goes really well with your curriculum. So if they have a planner, they line it up with the curriculum and you're good to go. Simple room setups, make sure you have a place for everything. Fish tanks, photos of water and beaches are really calming. And if you have a miniature waterfall that you can put in a room, some people have that that sound of water can help them focus. And also changing the environment of where you do school. Sometimes just merely taking them outside in that environment can just change, change everything. Also journaling and writing things down. So that's why nature studies is great for kids that have sensory processing. Teaching older kids how to take appropriate notes, having them use highlighters and markers and the magnificence of the smelly markers for some kiddos. Some kids hate it. So you kind of have to play with it. Are they gonna hate it? Are they gonna love it? It depends on the kid if they're overreactive or underreactive, but the sensory smelly markers can be great with taking notes if that's something that helps. It's there, it's a great tool. So when you're having learning time, there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of adjust. So if you're telling them a story, instead of having them just listen to the story, have them act it out, maybe tell it to you after you're done with a certain point, Alternate physical and hands-on subjects. So maybe you do physical education and then you do math and then you do art and then you do writing and then you do music and then you do reading. So alternating those subjects to kind of help them get their wiggles out, get their needs met, and then move on to a more focused, more in their case, some in some cases, stressful activity. Allow them to draw and doodle during any kind of lesson. Of course, like I said before, teach them how to properly take notes. Allow for gum and water. I mean, with, with boundaries, because sometimes we're using materials that we don't want to see get wet, and some of those kiddos may accidentally spill water. But if you can teach them how to keep their water bottle underneath their chair or next to their chair, and gum is, is a great tool to keep their mouth busy, especially if that is part of their sensory processing. Create fill-in-the-blank worksheets. Now I know some of us have gone to those churches where they have the bulletin, and in the bulletin there's a worksheet with the fill-in-the-blanks. You can simply, if you have time, do one of those kind of worksheets or find a curriculum that provides worksheets like that. As you're reading, fill in the blanks. So, great tool. You can create interactive workbooks. Games, games 
are amazing. You may even want to consider game schooling if gaming is your thing. Charades, you can play charades with pretty much any topic that you're discussing or any kind of guessing games card games. You can set up obstacle courses with learning. So you can have a bunch of answers in a hula hoop and have them jump to the correct answer. Constantly, constantly play games with them. Audiobooks. Audiobooks is another great tool. Sometimes reading can be very hard for some kids. So if you have an audiobook, just listening to it can be a game changer. Also build in a nap time. I know that sounds silly and probably doesn't make sense, but sometimes it is very difficult. It's much more harder for those kids that have sensory processing disorder to focus and get their work done, and they get tired and they fatigue easily. So sometimes building in a nap time or just a time for you to sit and relax, even if you're just staring at the ceiling for five minutes, sometimes they need that. Spontaneous singing. That's okay to do, especially with the little bitties. Just make up songs. They don't care about the way you sing. But it's great when you can spontaneously sing, have them make up songs with the subject at hand. Actually, that helps with memorizing too. So that's good for any kids. Now, brain breaks. I mentioned brain breaks, and that's when you actually take a section out of your day spontaneously throughout the day, maybe five minutes here, five minutes there, just to break free from all that heavy, heavy work that they're having to do, right? Because for them, it can be very heavy. And this is your chance to do lots of physical, physical activities, singing activities, playing instruments, beating on drums, play Simon Says, balancing activities, have them, you know, have them walk across the balance beam, take them to the playground, create obstacle courses, Find exercises that cross the midline. So that's a whole nother thing. This is your midline, and a lot of kids will struggle with crossing over the midline. So if you can do exercises that have them, like stretches and stuff, that have them cross over the midline, that, believe it or not, is gonna really, really help. Catching, hitting, throwing a ball, anything that you can do with a ball, play with the ball. Scooter boards are great. If you have a couple of those, have them scoot around on their tummies, scoot around on their knees, scoot around. Do chores. That's a brain break. It's a very helpful brain break, but it's a brain break. And doing chores are great. Yes, there's a lot of sensory stuff going on there. Textures, uh, forcing, pushing, pulling, all that, all that vestibular, yeah, everything. So doing chores help. Switch it up. They may not like that one as much. Dance party. Dance party while doing chores is great too, but dance parties are great. You can find a lot of dance parties on YouTube. Very, very super helpful. You can play with Play-Doh, kinetic sand. You can have a jumping jack contest and also hanging upside down. A lot of kids love that. Hanging upside down works amazing. So that, like I said, that's a, a very long list that I gave you, at least, at least over, way over 50, but you can have your own very own copy of that to use to reference whenever you need to. If you can't quickly jump on this video, you can have it, have it at your fingertips right here. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really hope it was helpful. Like I said, understanding sensory processing disorder is just a step to understanding what's going on with your kids and finding ways that you can accommodate and have fun with them. Have fun. It is really what it comes down to is having fun with them. Let me know in the comments what you thought. Share with me some of the stuff that you guys use with your kiddos. And until then, I will stick some videos around my face and I will see you on our next video.